On behalf of the Dickey Center for International Understanding, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this afternoon's event. It's my great pleasure today to welcome George Black to Dartmouth. George is a writer and a journalist. He is a native of Scotland, but currently lives in New York City. George, as I expect most of you know, has a very long and distinguished record of publications. He's published seven previous books before the one we're talking about today. And these cover a truly impressive variety of topics. Uh, the River Ganges, the democracy movement in China, conflict in Central America, the US West in the 19th century. George has also written numerous long form magazine articles for publications such as The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and, and many others besides. Today, George has come to discuss his new book, which is entitled The Long Reckoning, A Story of War, Peace, and Redemption in Vietnam. This book was published earlier this spring by Random House. As George will explain, this is a book about the Vietnam War, but it's not just a book about the Vietnam War. It's also a book about the many aftermaths of that conflict and the ways in which that war still frames and shapes the lives of so many Americans, Vietnamese, Lao, Cambodians, and other people. This is a book that has something to say about international relations and especially about the long and complex evolution of the relations between the United States and Vietnam. Um, over the last 25 years, and especially in the last decade or so, US-Vietnam relations have improved in unexpected and dramatic ways. If you think about the countries that with which the United States had antagonistic relations during the Cold War, countries like Russia, <clears throat> China, North Korea, Cuba, Iran, the United States relations with those countries today ranges from pretty bad to horrible still. But Vietnam is an exception to this trend and in recent years. And I think George's book has a lot to say about this unexpected warming in US-Vietnam relations. So this is partly a story of international relations. However, as you will see today, the book is really a story about human relations. It's a story, it's a collection of different Americans and Vietnamese who have come together and collaborated over the past 20 years or so to try to find solutions for some of the most persistent lingering effects of the war, especially the long-term effects of herbicides such as Agent Orange, as well as the ongoing dangers posed by unexploded mines, bombs, and shells in Vietnam. As a historian of the Vietnam War, I was really fascinated to read The Long Reckoning and the very compelling human stories which George tells in this book. And so it's really a great pleasure, George, to welcome you to Dartmouth today. I'm also very pleased to introduce a second guest, uh, Susan Hammond. Susan is the executive director and founder of the War Legacies Project. Uh, she currently resides not too far from here in Rockingham. And the War Legacies Project is a US-based multinational NGO that has helped many people in Vietnam, <clears throat> Laos, and Cambodia, and the United States to overcome some of the long-term human health and environmental consequences of the Vietnam War. And it's particularly appropriate that Susan is here today to be part of this conversation because her work with the War Legacies Project is not only directly relevant to what George is going to be talking about, but Susan is actually the star of the third section of the book. So, so we get one of the characters of the book as well as the author today. Um, just a word about format. Uh, George is going to begin. He's got some slides to show us. He's going to speak a little bit about the book. Uh, and then George, Susan, and I will have a conversation and then we will open up uh, the floor for questions. Uh, we're going to go until about 6.30, and then immediately afterwards, uh, there will be a book signing in the hallway outside. So those of you who haven't yet uh, purchased a copy of the book, there will be copies there, and George will be very pleased to sign one for you. So please join me in welcoming George Black to Dartmouth. Thank you, Ed. It's actually it's, it's a more than unusual Pleasure to be here with Susan, and also I want to recognize Lady Borton sitting behind Susan, who is another major uh, vital character in this story. A few things to say by way of introduction. I I'll assume that most people have a general sense of the geography of Vietnam. It's this long, skinny S shape. But the book, and most of what I want to talk about, focuses on a very, very small part. <clears throat> 
if you go right to the middle of this picture and imagine the distance from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon as it was, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,000 to 1,200 miles. And slap in the middle is the city of Hue, which was the old imperial capital and the demilitarized zone that divided North and South in 1954 with the withdrawal of the French. And in that small area that is covered by the DMZ, which is the jagged cross-hatched line up a center, and then the city's Da Nang, which was where the first Marines landed down in the southern part of that. This is where the book, by and large, transpires. And having said that about the geography, here's a quick word about the title and about the narrative arc and the thesis of the book that emerged from spending a lot of time in this particular area. And I do not claim to be in any way expert really about much of the rest of the country, but this is an area that from the very beginning, the first meeting, had a special kind of fascination for me, not just because I met some extraordinary people there whom you will meet in a moment, but also because so much of the worst physical destruction of the war was concentrated in these two areas. And to put them into perspective, if you draw a line across the demilitarized zone, down through Laos, along those dotted lines, which are the famous Ho Chi Minh Trail, and then cutting across to the city of Da Nang, because what you have here is this oddity, which is that the mountains which come all the way down, then cut across at right angles, all the way to the ocean, and they cut off the city of Da Nang from the city of Hue. And those physical arrangements, politically, geographically, militarily, psychologically, topographically, meteorology, any, any idically you can measure, there is something special about this region. And cumulatively, all of those things I came to see as I spent more time there, traveled more in the back country there, you know, they all go toward explaining why the physical destruction is so concentrated. And from that, I kind of developed um, I would hesitate to say a new concept or thesis about the war in Vietnam, but a way of understanding certain aspects of the destruction of the war and the long-term legacy of the war that I didn't really find addressed in the vast literature. I mean, I won't claim to have read every book on the war. There are apparently about 30,000 of them, so there's a limit to how much you can digest, but I'd never really seen anyone, with the exception of one academic who's a friend of a couple of us in the room, David Biggs, um, who teaches at the University of California in Riverside, uh, is married to a Vietnamese woman from Hue and knows this area extremely well. He's, he's done some remarkable work in explaining why this place is so different. So having said that, how does the narrative of a book like this take shape? Because my own personal experience is you don't enter the process of writing a book knowing what it's gonna say. You have the germ of an idea, you meet people, you find some charismatic characters, one thing leads to another, they know someone else, he's working on that, she's working on this, you see how they interlock. And gradually this thesis of the war began to emerge from that particular locality and this particular set of characters. And it began with an encounter with this guy whose name is Chuck Searcy, a young um, military intelligence recruit from a small town in Georgia, conservative family, military family, father was a POW in World War II, and all the boys in the family went into the military. He was a classic kind of Southern conservative, straight arrow, Barry Goldwater supporter, marching band and UGA. And this is him in Saigon in 1967 during the Tet Offensive, or early 68, I should say, during the Tet Offensive. And the way I found him originally was through the work he was doing on unexploded munitions. Uh, and really the area immediately south of the demilitarized zone 
is still to this day pretty much saturated with unexploded ordnance. It was an area of intense, constant battles for many years. This is a this is a mountain called the Rock Pile, which was kind of a legend among American veterans, Marines who fought in Vietnam. It's right on the demilitarized zone. And this is the discovery of one of many uh, caches of unexploded rocket propelled grenades in this case. And they're being unearthed for safe disposal by a member of an organization called Project Renew, which Chuck with a Vietnamese friend founded in 2001. This is one of his team in a scrapyard a few years ago near another of the very famous sites of the war in, in Quang Tri province, uh, Khe San, the famous marine base that was under siege from the North Vietnamese for 11 weeks preceding and during the Tet Offensive. And, you know, there aren't as many of these places as there were, but uh, this would have been probably in 2015, 16, and it's his colleague, Phu Nguyen, who, uh, you know, is just examining whether any of the things in the scrapyards are still likely to pose a danger. And so that was the first stage of the process. Why was this particular area littered with unexploded ordnance? The, the standard estimate is that since the war ended in 1975, something in the neighborhood of 40,000 Vietnamese have died from unexploded ordnance, and many thousands of Lao in the neighboring country. And it's impossible to understand the war in this area without understanding the war in Laos, <coughs> because that was the transit route by which northern forces came down and then found entry <coughs> points all along the way in uh, into uh, South Vietnam. The city of Dong Ha, where Project Renew is based, was really wiped off the face of the earth. Most of the province was. It was massively destroyed during the Tet Offensive, and then it was even more grievously destroyed four years later in 1972 as a result of a very major offensive where the North swept across the demilitarized zone, attempted to sever these two northern provinces of Quang Tri and Tia Tien from the rest of the country, taking advantage of that spur of the mountains that I mentioned that cuts the city of Da Nang off from the rest of uh, what's above it, the city of Hue. And that, when I, when I read and learned and talked to people in Quang Tri more about that period, it became clear that as I was reading the literature by really the last generation of academic scholars, the ones who have had access to the Vietnamese archives, former Soviet archives, East German archives, <coughs> things that were not available to scholars for many decades, there is a body of scholarship developing, which is very different from, I think, the traditional understanding that Americans have of what the war was about on the North Vietnamese side, who led it, who inspired it, who was its military strategist. And I think if you read books that came out from the 60s all the way through to really 20 years ago and even 10 years ago, they all focus on two characters. <clears throat> and I think the received wisdom among Americans is that the leader of the revolution, the inspirer of the war effort was Ho Chi Minh, seen here in Moscow, left center. <clears throat> but in fact, by the time the crucial battles took place, he had been very significantly displaced from power by his Politburo um, General Secretary Le Zuan, who is to his left with the, the fur hat. And Le Zuan, the irony of Le Zuan to me is not just that he was a much more inflexible and dogmatic figure than Ho Chi Minh, but that he was a native of the town of Dong Ha, which is the one you saw, the rubble of the town, from an offensive which was essentially something he insisted upon and persuaded the Politburo of in direct contradiction to the wishes of General Bo Ninh Jap, who was the 
the legendary military leader who I think Americans have always thought of as, you know, he was the military counterpart to Ho Chi Minh, the man who designed the Tet Offensive, the man who masterminded the military victory. Except that by and large, he didn't <coughs> because he was displaced by the only other five-star general in Vietnam, General Nhi Chi Tan, who's on the left of this picture, who was the closest military associate of General Secretary Le Zuan. And the war really from really quite early in the 60s, before American troops landed in significant numbers, it was Le Zuan and his cohort of loyalists who were much more dogmatic than Ho Chi Minh and then General Zap, who were substantially in command of the war effort. Um, through Chuck Searcy, I began to meet a community of other veterans and Center left here, leaning forward with the dark hair, is a man called Manus Campbell, who is the second, the other pivotal character, really, in the story of the veterans who went back. And Manus is someone from a very, very different background from Chuck Searcy, a very different war experience. They were there almost to the week at exactly the same time, 67 to 68, the worst period of the war. The Tet Offensive came midway. And Manus was from a lower middle class family in Bayonne, New Jersey, Irish Catholic family, six kids. <clears throat> and he was kind of a, not sickly, but a, a quiet kid, sort of unassuming, underweight. Father thought he was a weakling, wanted him to be a real man. And a lot of boys who signed up, and he, like most, was 19 years old. That was the average of the kids who went in. He wanted to join the Marines because he wanted to be a hero and he wanted to stand tall in the eyes of his father. And Manus essentially experienced just about every variety of hell that an American Marine could go through in the particular area where my story is set. He served successively in many of the worst places, the city of Hue, the roads to the famous Ashaw Valley, side of Hamburger Hill. <clears throat> this is the Marine base at Contien, right on the DMZ, constantly shelled and mortared for the months he was there. And then finally, he ended up on a new spur of the Ho Chi Minh Trail just inside the Lao border. And he went through something like 85% of all the combat operations in Vietnam were initiated by the People's Army of Vietnam, the North Vietnamese Army or the Viet Cong. And they always had the Americans at a disadvantage because they knew the terrain. And the, the response of the Americans to the, these advantages of understanding the geography, the mountains, the jungle, the cover, was to throw technology at the problem. And that technology took infinite forms, bombing these gigantic plows, roam plows that just cleared the countryside, you know, 10,000 pound bombs that cleared an entire area big enough for a helicopter landing zone, thousands of helicopters, hundreds of bombers, spy planes, I mean, every form of technology. And one of the early chapters in my book is called Off Mountains and Machines. And th that was essentially the battle that the, the Vietnamese had the mountains, the Americans had the machines. <clears throat> and to Americans' disbelief, the machines did not prevail. And people like Manus were thrown into these so-called search and destroy operations against an enemy they couldn't see in a terrain they didn't understand. Uh, in horrendous physical conditions. And of course, the physical conditions for the Vietnamese on the other side were every bit as grim and every bit as terrifying. Um, but at least it was their country and it was their fight. And uh, Manus was just one of many, many kids who emerged from that experience with a lifetime's case of post-traumatic stress disorder. I took all the familiar forms. Every, everyone who went through it is unique. Everyone experienced it in a particular way. You could have thrown a lot of kids through the same battles Manus went through, and they'd all have come out processing it in their different ways. But alcoholism, drug abuse, broken marriages, et cetera, et cetera. And just an inability to deal with the external world and to make sense of the experience. <clears throat> because no one you came home to could make sense of it, and you couldn't communicate it. You know, Americans don't lose wars, but they lost this one. How do you handle that? 
So PTSD is a huge defining factor for so many of the Marines who go back, so many of the Americans in general who have gone back. And the main thing that brings so many of them together is dealing with the biggest and worst of all of the physical traumas, legacies resulting from the war, which is the long-term effects of exposure to Agent Orange, the herbicide, <coughs> which is laced by reputedly the most toxic substance known, dioxin, a particular form of dioxin, which causes a multitude of uh, medical problems. And when the Vietnamese, first of all, the American veterans had to fight for 15 years after the end of the war before even they could get recognition that all the diseases from which they were suffering, the, the kids they were giving birth to with birth defects, the miscarriages their wives were suffering, <coughs> that these things were somehow connected. And America, by and large, so much did not want to deal with its veterans. They were too much of an embarrassment. It was like, please, can we just forget this war? So they had to fight 15 years. The Vietnamese had to fight for much longer. And one of the most important parts of the book to me is trying to tell really for the first time, I think, in, in a book in English, that the Vietnamese scientists who did the early work on Agent Orange, and I'm talking about going right back to the late 60s, early 70s, they were written off well into the 2000s. Um, several of us here know a diplomat, an American ambassador, Ted Osius, who served there initially as a political military officer in the late 1990s. <clears throat> he later went on to become ambassador but he was chief science officer for Southeast Asia, for the State Department, and he would say into the early 2000s, years after the normalization of relations, you were not allowed as an American official to speak the words Agent Orange in a conversation with the Vietnamese. But the people who had done the work, they were written off as propagandists, extortionists, communist liars. These were world-renowned scientists. And the father, really, of this school of science was this man, Dr. Ton Tat Tung. He was writing scholarly articles about liver disease in The Lancet, you know, the great prestigious British medical journal, um, probably with the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the two most prestigious in the world. He was a pioneering scientist, and he had a series of successors, <clears throat> a young uh, Vietnamese OBGYN, Dr. Ngoc Tuan, on the left here, and her husband, who was a, a North Vietnamese general. Um, she, big, she was early on, having worked under Dr. Tung, very aware of the patterns of birth defects, abnormal births, uh, spontaneous miscarriages. <coughs> and then another generation, uh, Dr. Huang Ding Cao, who was the head of a government committee, uh, looking into the long-term effects of Agent Orange, and a very charismatic young doctor, Dr. Le Cardai. His wife here was a, an artist. And he operated a secret field hospital in the central highlands of Vietnam during the war that was constantly under attack from bombing. It was on the a spur of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, bombing, spraying with Agent Orange. And what he was seeing in his field hospital is all these countless cases of liver cancer in healthy young men, you know, men in their 20s coming off the battlefield with liver cancer. <clears throat> so they were working for decades, unrecognized by the American government, unaccepted, except by a small handful of foreign scientists who came in, and this is a common feature that links together all of the various subgroups of characters in my book. I, I describe them as forming a kind of Venn diagram in which you had a circle of veterans who went back. You had a circle of humanitarian aid workers of whom Susan and Lady represent two strands of that tradition. And then you have a circle of scientists and they all coalesce really uh, around the various issues they're working on, but above all Agent Orange. And the most important of them in terms of an alliance with the Vietnamese is a group of Canadians. And I want to stress 
their alliance with the Vietnamese in every case I talk about with all of these groups. They came to Vietnam with essentially two questions, and they were not questions the Vietnamese were accustomed to hearing from foreigners. They were first, what do you need? And second, how can we help? And that's a radically different attitude than swanning in saying, we've got the answers to what you need, because the Vietnamese had heard a lot of that, and they were rather tired of hearing that. But all of these groups came and said, how can we help? We have some technical expertise, we have some resources. <clears throat> and the Canadians came into the Ashaw Valley, the location of Hamburger Hill, which had been massively sprayed during the war. And two of the doctors who um, I just showed the portraits of, Dr. Lake Aldai and Dr. Huang Ding Kao, had actually worked in the Ashaw Valley. And they saw it as a place where you could do a sort of unique scientific study. It's a very remote area. It's an area almost entirely at that time inhabited by ethnic minority people. There was no industry. In other words, if you found traces of dioxin, which can also come from cement factories or municipal incinerators or other industrial sources, if you found it in Hanoi or in Saigon, you couldn't tell where it came from. If you found it in the Ashaw Valley, you knew it was from Agent Orange. So the Canadians and the Vietnamese um, commission committee that uh, the 1080 committee that those two doctors worked with, they partnered to do a study of the Ashaw Valley, which would essentially be a soup to nuts study that would trace how the chemicals moved all of the way from the spray tanks aboard the aircraft that dropped them all the way into the soil, the forests, the water, the ducks, the chickens, the fish that swam in the water and eventually worked their way into the human body. Tom Boivin, who uh, was the lead researcher on this particular uh, one of three expeditions they made to the Ashaw Valley, is taking samples. These are Katu ethnic minority villagers collecting grass carp to sample um, the, the tissue to, to find out the dioxin levels because dioxin concentrates in fatty tissues. So fish are a very big target for it. They go for the liver, they go for the fatty tissue. And that is how they then, the, the toxin is then transmitted into the human body. And they persuaded the Katu people uh, who have a religion based on the worship of spirits, a belief that spirits regulate everything in the external world and are very, very reluctant to do things like surrender blood because it affects part of their spirit being taken. But finally, the Vietnamese doctors working with the Canadian scientists persuaded these villagers to give a little blood and persuaded the women to give a little breast milk. And to cut a very long story short, by the time this survey was done, the thesis was developed that Agent Orange was not everywhere. Part of what paralyzed the discussion was the idea it had been sprayed on one sixth of the land area of the country. So how did you begin to get a handle on that? And what emerged from this study was that the worst of the contamination was around the ruins of an old American Special Forces base, which had been used for spraying. All the surrounding area had been sprayed. It had been destroyed in a battle. Chemicals had obviously leaked into the ground. And from that emerged what came to be known as the hotspot theory, which was, and again, it's a very long story, and if you want to know it, it's all in the book in great detail, but the field was narrowed down in the end to a very small number of former air bases where the chemicals had been stored, loaded onto airplanes, flown to their targets, including in Laos. And again, that brings us back to the fact that you can't understand the destructiveness of the war in this particular area without understanding the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. This was taken on a trip that I made in 2019 with Susan and with her colleague Jackie Chagnon, who run this wonderful organization, the War Legacies Project. 
which was essentially testing a hypothesis. We found that there had indeed been a lot of spraying on the Laos side of the border. It was a deep secret. It was one of the most closely held secrets of the war. But it was done in quantity. It was done along the Ho Chi Minh Trail so you could localize very specifically uh, where the operations had taken place, where the villages were that were in the flight lines. And Susan and Jackie have gone about documenting cases of birth defects and disabilities that can plausibly be associated with exposure to Agent Orange during the war into the third and even now, at least theoretically, the Vietnamese would argue there are a couple of thousand cases into the fourth generation since the war. And again, the belt of transmission, it's genetic transmission, breast milk is the primary mode of transmission from one generation to the next. And we, we talk a lot about Agent Orange victims. The, the last, there's not a photograph of him in, in this little slideshow, but the last of the characters I talk about in the book uh, is a man called Charles Bailey, who was the head of the Ford Foundation office in Vietnam. Uh, from 1997 to 2007 and put up the kind of money that was not available elsewhere and the sort of political clout that the Ford Foundation could bring to the problem to complement the work that everyone else was doing and funded and, and correctly I think you know the United States government did eventually agree to spend hundreds of millions of dollars cleaning up the two biggest air bases that were left contaminated by Agent Orange. But I think everyone who worked seriously on the issue, including people like Lady and Susan and the veterans who were concerned with Agent Orange, the Canadian scientists, everyone said the real moral center of the problem is not cleaning up these air bases, which are off limits to the public anyway. You can wall them off, you can do landfills, in fact, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars in ongoing projects to superheat the dioxin contaminated soil. It takes decades. It's going to cost, it could end up costing a billion dollars. The money that's necessary for the victims is what people in Washington call decimal dust. It's, it's very small amounts of money. But I think most people concerned with the issue say it's a much bigger priority. It's a much larger human priority. <clears throat> and Charles introduced me originally to this man who was born, in a, born to parents who had traveled through the country, through sprayed areas, fleeing from the north, uh, the area that I write about, all the way down to the outskirts of Saigon. And he was born with these very serious deformities. And because he's a character, his name is Chow, and because he has this extraordinary willpower as a person, he's been able to accomplish extraordinary things. He's a mouth painter. He's very gifted. But the message, I think, of the programs that are supported by groups like the War Legacies Project and others is that a very small amount of money, you can talk about your chair. I want you to talk about your plastic chair. Flag yeah. that for later. Uh, a very small amount of money per household, per individual, can give people who may not have Chow's particular strength of character, but can give them the ability to vault into a normal life and into a life that can be transformed at very, very low cost and need not be a partisan issue, which is one thing that kept coming back to me as I looked at the different groups who were working on Agent Orange, particularly in places like the Ashaw Valley where all this work was done. I know, for example, a Marine veteran who lives in the city of Da Nang, married to a Vietnamese woman, radical anti-war veteran. Every spring, he partners with a former airborne guy who is a Trump supporter who wears a red MAGA hat. And they work together to take bicycles to ethnic minority kids in the Ashaw Valley so they can get to school. And it's kind of an example. One of my heroes in the story um, is Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, who of course just retired, and has constantly insisted there is nothing partisan about this issue. You can feel however you want about the war. 
But the issue is a humanitarian issue that transcends that. And he has always insisted, not always successfully, that when he took fellow senators and members of Congress to Vietnam, he insisted on having Republicans along. Uh, so anyway, the, the message of that, this does not have to be a partisan issue. This is the one photograph I have that comes closest to reconstructing almost all of the, what I'm calling the Venn diagram. On the left is Grant Bruce, who is one of the Canadian scientists who did the study of the Ashaw Valley and then of the air base hotspots. Lady Borton is in the center with her very close Vietnamese friend Fong, and that partnership has been really critical to everything Lady has done in her decades in Vietnam. And second from the right is Chuck Searcy, uh, the taller of the, uh, the non-Vietnamese at the end of the line. And this is three sectors coming together, the ex-veterans, the Canadian scientists, the humanitarian aid, um, lady worked in Vietnam during the war doing humanitarian aid for the, the Quaker American Friends Service Co Committee. This is then coming together to look at a chemically contaminated site in the city of Quy Nhon around 2001 uh, as a sort of model for how you could deal with, with sites of chemical contamination. And then finally a photograph that just means a great deal to me. The Americans they had a pretty mixed bag of ambassadors, but the last couple, uh, I mentioned Ted Osius, who was there under Obama. His successor, Dan Crittenbrink, on the left, has really, uh, he served until two years ago. He's now Assistant Secretary, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for, for Asian Affairs. Um, a good man, very much admired. And this is him at the great Chung Son Martyrs Cemetery on the DMZ in Quang Tri Province to honor those who died on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, 33,000 is the standard figure. And next to him, and why I like this photograph so much, uh, in the middle is Huang Nam, who was Chuck Searcy's partner in founding Project Renew to dispose of unexploded ordnance. Uh, they created that group in 2001. So here I think is a moment where Everything comes together honoring the Vietnamese war dead, a remembrance that their war dead were countless times greater than the American war dead, and a formal process of reconciliation with a strong spiritual dimension and an officer in the People's Army of Vietnam also uh, involved in that ceremony. And that photograph sort of sums up, I think, where, where I leave the book and where I'll leave this talk and pass it over to Susan and, and, and others. So, Great. thank you. <laughs> Have you in the middle here, George? <coughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, George, for, uh, for that, uh, that fantastic uh, summary. And, uh, Having uh, recently completed the book, I'll let everyone know that uh, there's so much more in the book. You haven't you you, you haven't uh, haven't given it all away. Um, so there there's so many uh, questions and things that occurred to me when I uh, when I read this book, and um, so it's been a little bit difficult for me to uh, sort of narrow it down. But the the one that I wanted to start with actually has to do with the title and the mm. the long reckoning. And I'm wondering if I could ask you to say a little bit more about the nature of this reckoning. What has been reckoned with and who is doing the reckoning here? That's a really good question. Um, sometimes the hardest thing about a book is finding a title. And in this case, it was actually the easiest thing because the moment I saw this quote, which is from Thomas Jefferson, I just bang. It was the title. He, this is a letter he wrote in 1808. And he said, the evils of war are great in their endurance and have a long reckoning for ages to come. <clears throat> and it resonated with me for a lot of reasons, partly, I guess, personal. I mean, I grew up in London. All through the 60s, there were, you know, buildings, whole blocks of my neighborhood that were still bomb damaged. I mean, had not been rebuilt. 
from a war that ended 20 years earlier. So I think the long reckoning part, uh, that was the organizing principle of the book. I would say the reckoning, it is very much unfinished. I think there has been a general and in some ways surprising, surprisingly broad acceptance within the American government that there has to be a reckoning in terms of recognizing and assuming responsibility for the fact that this war, it still has its defenders. There are still traumas that will never be resolved. There will still always be people who say we should have won, we should have nuked them, we fought with one hand tied behind our backs. But I think there's a general acceptance that for good reasons and also you could say for you don't even have to say unprincipled reasons, but pragmatic or strategic reasons, there has been a willingness to move on. I mean, I think there is a significant recognition by people in the State Department, people in the US Agency for International Development who are in charge of humanitarian aid and reconciliation programs that, you know, Vietnam is owed a great deal to make good for what was done. There is another sector, as there always is, of government who are driven, ironically, by geostrategic concerns that in an odd way are kind of a new twist on what took America to Vietnam in the first place, which is Chinese expansion. You know, it used to be the advance of international communism, which was going to sweep through Southeast Asia with dominoes falling. And now it's a, it's a concern that Vietnam shares with Chinese expansion in the South China Sea, South, with Chinese economic expansion in general. Um, one always has to bear in mind that the, a lot of times when you talk to Vietnamese about why they have no significant ill feeling left about Americans, it's, you know, one general colonel said to me, you know, <laughs> the Americans were only here for 10 years. You know, the Chinese were, the, the French were here for 100 and the Chinese have been messing with us for 2000. So those interests, those concerns with Chinese expansion and then obviously things like trade, um, other forms of, you know, strategic and economic alliance have also driven the process of reconciliation. Uh, there is still, there is a chapter at the end of the book called Unfinished Business and I would say there are ways and I would still say there are ways affecting American veterans where the reckoning is incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still many American veterans who are denied benefits from the Veterans Administration, uh, often backed by arguments from the chief toxicologist of the Air Force, who was their primary expert on Agent Orange, Dr. Alvin Young, who has made a fortune as a consultant to the Veterans Administration. Um, to argue against what he calls freeloaders, trying to get de benefits to which they're not entitled. So I think American veterans still have um, a justifiable degree that, uh, of, of disillusionment. But I would say the biggest of all of the pieces of unfinished business, what I try to trace in the book is a process by which, one of the ironies to me of this war is that usually the terms of post-war development are set by the side that wins the war. And in this particular case, they were set by the losers because the Americans had not only a lot of anger and resentment and bitterness, they also had the resources and the power to determine that Vietnam was not going to be allowed to break out of this stranglehold economically, politically, until it did one thing, which was a full the, or the fullest possible is the phrase, accounting for Americans missing in action. The Americans lost two and a half thousand, 2,600 missing in action during the war. And I think entirely justifiably, it's a moral obligation to me, humanitarian obligation, you send young men to war, they're left on the battlefield, you bring them back. That's a fine and honorable thing but it became the precondition for any conversation with the Vietnamese for years. 
And then as the Vietnamese realized that it was also in their interest to help search for these missing Americans, about a thousand of whom have now been found and repatriated, given burial. But it's taken until two years ago for the United States, for the first time, to offer to help the Vietnamese find their missing in action. And whereas the United States had about 2,600, no one even has a clue how many Vietnamese there were. 300,000 is the figure you most often hear. Uh, and it's a very small program. It's only in single digits and millions of dollars. Nonetheless, it's an attempt to aid the Vietnamese to recover their dead and then to do DNA identification of their dead. And a lot of organizations, Vietnamese and American, are involved in this. What is important to me about it is that you do not hear a word of complaint from Vietnamese families. The last trip I made in November, which was after the book was written, uh, I spent a lot of time with Vietnamese families and, and North Vietnamese veterans who are thrilled to learn that America is giving a couple of million dollars to help them find their loved ones. And there's, again, inexplicably, I think, to Americans, uh, an absolute lack of bitterness. You know, I talked to one North Vietnamese veteran, extraordinary man, Lady Borton, very wonderfully made the introduction to him, who has spent his entire life since the war searching for the remains of members of his unit who came from his commune. And he's dedicated his life to finding them. He broke down and wept when he found that the American government and Harvard University and the US Institute for Peace and others are now working to try to retrieve their remains. There was no talk of, my God, what terrible double standards, you know, too little, too late, none of that. Only a joy that this collaboration was possible. Sorry, that's a very long answer to your question. But. No, that's fine. Susan, is there anything you want to weigh in on, on this question of, of reckoning? Yeah, I mean, reckoning was part of the reason I went to Vietnam in the first place, because it's interesting that 1967-68 ties everybody in this book together in so many ways. Lady, I think you were there at that time, were you? No, I no. was in our home office. OK, but um, Jackie Shenyong, I believe, was there. Um, Sally and Steve Benson, who fund my organization with the Chino Cienega Foundation, they were in Saigon at that time. My father did his first tour of Vietnam in 67, 68 in Saigon. And I went, <clears throat> I was on this round the world bicycle trip in 1991 and got to Bangkok and that was when it was just opening up to allow foreigners to go in. Um, and said, I gotta go, because I could not, for the light, my father never talked about the war at all. Uh, he wasn't in combat, he was an um, Army Corps of Engineer, but he never talked about the war. And I just wanted to kind of get an understanding about why, why were we there? Because I was, I graduated in high school in 1983, so it wasn't quite in our, well, it's still not in our history books in high school, but it definitely wasn't in our history books in 83. Mm -hmm. um, but trying to get an understanding of it, why, what took my father away, in fact, he went two tours, so for almost three years of my life as a child, what was so important about this war in this country? And I went and I found even, you know, in 91, the Vietnamese um, were very welcoming. Um, and they, they're very pragmatic people. Um, that, and I was just fascinated by that, that they were just moving forward to the future in 91. I mean, it was still the embargo. You could still see um, scars of the war everywhere. Very poor, incredibly poor country. Um, and, but they were move, looking towards the future. And I was just trying to grasp how how could we have been caused such a devastation to a country and they still welcomed Americans with open arms, even in 1991. So that got me interested in Vietnam in the first place and I knew I wanted to go back somehow and do some work there. Um, and eventually I, I did and that's um, working on reconciliation issues and then meeting Lady and meeting Lake Kao Dai and all, I mean this was like going back and, uh, 
not history with me, but I mean, just seeing all those slides of those of people who are in your book is just these are all of the Vietnamese who, who really helped me understand the country and helped me understand the need to just be practical, get something, just do something to address the problem and not worry so much. I mean, because they were dealing with the US government who, like you said, would not raise the Agent Orange issue at all. In fact, I, in, even in 2005, I was at the embassy in, in Hanoi with a group of peace activists that we were bringing into the country. And the DCM, no, he was the political affairs office, public affairs official, I'm sorry, met with us and he's, we, one of the um, members of the group, raised the Agent Orange issue in 2005. And he said, I'm tired of hearing about Agent Orange. Why do all these Americans raise Agent Orange? And he, he said, we should be thankful of what Americans did for Vietnam. I'm like, what? <laughs> we all looked at him like, what do you mean? And he said, when we left, we, that, that Highway 1 that you just rode on, we built that. That was airports that you landed in, we built that. We did not destroy them <laughs> like the French did any name. I can't remember which country that the French had a colony in that they destroyed. But I, that was the attitude as of 2005. So we're, we're talking about this reckoning. It's some people, and I'm facing some of this attitude in Laos in my work actually, mm -hmm. with, with some, with sadly our current ambassador who does not believe that there's any, possible impact of Agent Orange in Laos. And this, this sense of, you know, they, they should be grateful for what we're giving them. And, and thankfully, I think that attitude has left the em embassy in, in, in Vietnam, but it's still there in some cases. Well, the, the, the lingering presence of it is interesting. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking back, you know, in the, the late 1990s, Robert McNamara mm -hmm. very famously went to Hanoi. He went a couple of times. And he went uh, the second time to have these uh, meetings in a, sort of a high profile event where he met with some of his counterparts, uh, the leaders of, of the North Vietnamese state and party during the, the Vietnam War. And the, the, the visit was, was covered. You can read articles about it in the New York Times. And he professed that he was interested in learning about the mistakes that were made. But if you read the coverage of it, it's very clear what he's trying to do in that visit, which was to basically say mistakes were made. Yes, I made some mistakes, but we all made some mistakes. There were some, some mutual misperceptions. And the Vietnamese were having none of it. Mm -hmm. They said, no, the, the mistakes were what you made, you know, Mr. S Secretary. And, and th this is actually the, the, the question sort of lurking behind my question here about this reckoning. Because there is a way in which you can take the issue of Agent Orange. You can sort of say, well, this is a humanitarian issue. Mm -hmm. This is something we should do. And the US government, there are people in the US government who can see the advantage in doing that and see the advantage in, in providing the kind of aid which is, which is so, as, as both of you have pointed out, is so important, so desperate to provide. But at the same time, that can kind of deflect other kinds of reckoning. This is mm -hmm. where the, the unfinished nature of the reckoning mm -hmm. can be. There, as, as we know, there are all kinds of other aspects of the history of the Vietnam War the moral implications of American actions that the U.S. government still doesn't want to talk about and still won't talk about. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, if either of you have, have any thoughts about this. If the, the progress that we see in, in these areas, which, which you've done so much work on, Susan, and George, you document so well in the book, perhaps may have the effect of inhibiting reckoning or, or uh, coming to grips with some of the, the other histories of the war? You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, maybe I can answer that with an anecdote, actually, which is that on Saturday, I did a book signing at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. 
thanks to a friend who I think several of us know, who was the, is the director emeritus of the museum and is now actually working with the Vietnamese and with the US Agency for International Development to talk about a remodeling, reconception of the famous War Remnants Museum in Ho Chi Minh City, which began as the uh, so-called exhibition house for American and puppet war crimes. And so he helpfully arranged for me to do a signing there and they set me up with, <coughs> it was part of a weekend of events that the Smithsonian was co-sponsoring for veterans on the National Mall. And there was a little tent city where, you know, Vietnam Veterans of America, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation, the POW MIA families, lots of groups had tents there. And they had an auditorium set up, outdoor stage, and veterans were coming up to give speeches. And they were all very, very, um, you know, God and country and patriotism. And I went to serve my country and I went to do good and I went to honor my my flag and you know. So I went from there to the Smithsonian and they'd set up this table at the entrance to a section of the museum, if you've ever been there, called the Price of Freedom. And I was very struck by the wording of that, the general rubric for then these series of exhibits on all of America's wars. And the introductory language on Vietnam is the United States went to Vietnam to stop the spread of international communism. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly the ostensible rationale at the time, but I, I thought to myself, I wonder, knowing how these things work, committees and planning groups and executive decisions and edited memos with track changes, all this stuff went on <laughs> to, to determine what the wording of that paragraph would say yeah. and how by that process of political discussion and consensus and not offending anyone and you know that was the wording they ended up with and i'd love to see that memo with the track changes on it <laughs> um, but that is still you know has to be the acceptable language and it you know people many many veterans would not get farther than the first five minutes of the first episode of the famous ken burns mm. series which was, you know, however many 19 hours of TV, because the opening sequence says, the narrator Peter Coyote says, the war in Vietnam was a war of good intentions that went awry. And tens of thousands of veterans said, the hell with that, I'm not watching another minute of it, because it was not a war of good intentions. I think you can make a case that if you really want to debate what constitutes good intentions, yeah, there's an argument that in the context of the moment, and you, you, know, you, you get to know special forces people who were there in the early 60s, and it was like they went into, they were like the Peace Corps, they went into inoculate kids and teach peasants how to farm. I mean, yeah, there were good intentions, but they were so complicated and screwed up. But we have to simplify the story, yeah. you know? And that and simplifications of history are always a minefield. Yeah, which kind of worries me when I, <laughs> I hear about this um, USAID funding and revising the Agent Orange exhibit at the War Remnants Museum. I, um, I mean, the people I think involved are quite good. I mean, I know most of them. But, but you wonder how that is going to be told in a way that's going to be honest. By yes. the, on the American side. <laughs> I, I, have, I, I have the same questions. Yeah. And I wonder if they will, uh, the two sides will be able to agree and what they will be able to agree on. Yeah. And uh, that perhaps will be an, an interesting, um, a revealing measure of the degree of reckoning yeah. that's taken place. It's the next yes. magazine article I want to write. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> Good. I'm on we'll it. look forward to that. <laughs> let, let, let me ask you about another R word that's yeah. in the book. It's also in the title, but fig figures very prominently in the book, and that's redemption. So the book has three parts, peace, war, and redemption. And, or sorry, war, peace, and redemption. Let me get the order right. And uh, so it follows the chronological arc. The first part is mostly about the events of the war and the experiences that many of the characters had then. 
And then you look at the period after 1975 in the second part. And then finally, in the last part of the book, is where the, the individuals who are in the Venn diagram come together uh, to, uh, to produce the, the work that you've described for us here. With the redemption, who is being redeemed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what is the nature of this redemption? What are they being redeemed from? You ask really great questions. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is they all need half an hour at least to respond. No, it's the most tricky word in the title, in the subtitle, because it, it's a word deliberately with multiple meanings. Um, at the most obvious level, it's about the redemption that the returning veterans in particular experience. And Manus Campbell's story, which really wraps around the whole story, and it is the grace note, if you want to put it that way, at the end of the book, is that Manus, still not completely, but to a large degree, has achieved a kind of personal redemption. You know, he's emerged from a personal hell and has a, you know, he still has nightmares, but on that personal level, that's one thing. Can America redeem itself from what it did? We've talked about some of that question really in our answers to the other ones. I mean, yes, to some degree, no, to some degree. Has Vietnamese society redeemed itself? It's not something I get into in the book in part because I want to leave it for what I hope will be a paperback edition with an additional chapter, which would be about the lack of reconciliation between North and South, mm -hmm. and particularly focused on the issue of the Southern war dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a hellishly complicated subject. When I said that the United States is now helping Vietnam recover and identify its war dead, for clear political reasons, which will also come to bear on the redesign of the War Remnants Museum, for sure. The recognition of the Southern War Dead challenges in a fundamental way the Vietnamese official history of the war. They are not derided in quite the same cruel way they were. Um, there are formulations of words that avoid the talk of, you know, puppets. That was always the, the epithet in the past. Nonetheless, uh, they are not acknowledged or honored. And this program is restricted to the discovery of what the Vietnamese call the martyrs, uh, which is essentially those who fought for the North or fought with the, the NLF, the so-called Viet Cong. And that involves the Vietnamese American community and those who have gone back. Uh, it involves a lot of, you know, barely below the surface still animosities between South and North, uh, Southern resentment of the North. Has American society redeemed itself? Oh. It was very interesting when I, when I was trying to sell the book, uh, I was also writing a series of magazine articles about the persistence of the military in the growth of far-right politics in America. And I was tracing it back to Vietnam, basically starting with January 6th and saying, why were South Vietnamese flags flying on January 6th? What was that about? Yeah. You know, what is the iconography of, of, of Trump as Rambo? What's that about? And, and in the proposal for the book, there was this additional theme, which was the legacy of the war in poisoning a certain sector of American politics, and in really being fundamental to the growth of the idea of the enemy within, which is basically part of the whole MAGA patriot rhetoric. Um, and one publisher said, yes, that's the book I want to do, and Knopf, said, no, 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 that's a different book. And having written The Long Reckoning for Knopf, they were absolutely right. It would have made it a different book, but it's another part of the redemption, and it has not happened. No. I don't think America still to this day has really reconciled itself to what Vietnam was about. 
you know, there's a generalized, oh, we shouldn't get involved in foreign wars. And people on the left and people on the right will all say that. And Iraq and Afghanistan reinforced that. But that they had this kind of honored in the breach, I would say. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So boy, is that a complicated question. <laughs> Redemption for whom? Yeah. To what degree? So I, I have many more questions, but, but I am having dinner with you afterwards. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna restrain myself here and I'd like to, to open it up now to, uh, to members of the audience to, uh, to ask questions to, to either or both of our guests. So I actually had two questions, but I'm gonna try and phrase it as one and you can answer either or both. Um, I jotted them down, so I'm gonna try and do my best here. Um, so when you talk a lot about people's memory and their reckonings, um, you talk a lot about the you know, war generation and their lack of bitterness. What do you see within the rising generation, you know, the younger generation who doesn't really have the firsthand war memory, but is still really dealing with a lot of the consequences of the war? And then kind of equally, most of the people that you talk about being involved from the American side have a firsthand experience of the war as protesters, as veterans, as volunteers. Do you think there will be a change in future policy or efforts as that generation ages out of politics and people without that firsthand generation come into positions of power operating NGOs or you know, being in Congress or other governmental positions? Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, there's no doubt that in general, the younger generation, it's a very young country, and it's a very dynamic young country. There is not a great deal of interest, knowledge, focus, I would say. I mean, these two know Vietnam much, much better than I do, and they should speak to that part of the question. That is my perception, that young people, they want to learn English, they want to get ahead, they're pro-American, they're pretty materialistic in many senses. Um, on the American side, it was interesting. A, a Vietnamese magazine asked me recently to do a Q&A about the book. And it was an interesting little vignette into how sensitive this topic is. And this is a, this is a, Vietnam, a Vietnamese magazine called Youth News. Um, I won't attempt to pronounce it because I'll butcher it, but these guys can. Do it, yeah. There you go. Um, they asked me to do a Q&A and I said, I'll do it on one condition, which is that you don't edit what I say. So the last question was, are young Americans interested in the war in Vietnam? And are they working to help Vietnam? My son happens to be in Afghanistan, uh, it's, sorry, in, in uh, Ukraine at the moment doing humanitarian relief work. And the way I answered the question was, um, I think it's difficult for a younger generation of Americans because they have much more contemporary crises to worry about. If they're politically active, they tend to be very engaged in climate change. They have more recent wars like Iraq and Afghanistan. And right now, if they're concerned about foreign wars, it's about the humanitarian cost of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So technically they didn't answer that. They didn't edit that question. They simply cut it. <laughs> so they had a very interesting kind of uh, piece of sophistry about, about that. I, sort of, I knew they wouldn't. I put it in there provocatively, mm -hmm. just as sort of interesting little litmus test. They took it out. Um, but I think more seriously, the generational question with Senator Leahy's retirement from the Senate and equally or more important, the retirement of his senior aide, Tim Reeser, mm -hmm. who is an unsung hero. He's mentioned in the book, but not to the degree he should be. Um, they are the ones who have forced through the Congress and the appropriations process um, every piece of important financial aid to Vietnam for humanitarian reasons. And the tragedy, Senator Leahy, when I went in November, it was supposed to be to accompany Senator Leahy on a trip, a congressional delegation. He had to pull out at the last minute because of ill health, but he could not get a Republican to go with him. And every previous, the two previous delegations he had made, I'd been, Susan was there also on one of them in 2019 to inaugurate the big dioxin cleanup at the Ben Hoa Air Base. There were three Republicans there, 
Um, he couldn't get any last time. And you worry, there is a generation of American, uh, of Democrats, Chris Coons of Delaware, Jeff Merkley of Oregon, Susan Baldwin of... Tammy Baldwin. Uh, so Tammy Baldwin <coughs> of Wisconsin. Wisconsin. There are several really good young Democrats or younger Democrats. But it, as I said, it should be an inherently bipartisan issue. And the, Demo the Republicans who went before, Lisa Murkowski was there, Rob Portman of Ohio, who of course now is no longer with us. We have J.D. Vance in Ohio. Um, so that worries me tremendously that the political will, especially the bipartisan political will, is not going to be there. Yeah, I was actually in Vietnam a couple of weeks ago and Senator Merkley was there on the sort of postponed Leahy trip and it was, um, they couldn't even get five senators. You need five senators to do a CODEL or members of the House in order to get a plane, otherwise it's impossible to travel around with these CODELs. But it was Merkley and um, Chris Van Hollen, is it Chris Van Hollen, Maryland? Maryland, yes. Yeah. Um, and then three reps, including Jayapal and Omar and someone from- Lujan? Uh, uh, I can't remember who it was from Texas. Um, and Merkley was actually very good. I mean, he's sort of been handed over from Leahy, the, you know, the, the job of carrying through the war legacy issues that, um, you know, the, the USAID and the embassy in Hanoi, Lady remembers this very well, came kicking and screaming into when the first three million was, uh, was allocated by Leahy in 2007. They <laughs> sat on that for a couple years before they could figure out you know, what, they did not want to touch this issue at all. They, they went into it um, really hesitantly. Um, and then they turn around and now they're, they're saying how this has really helped to foster better, stronger relations between the U.S. and Vietnam, particularly, be, you know, dealing like we talked earlier with, with China. And, but also just they see, they see this as very important in working together to address a very sensitive issue and finding a way to communicate. And that has translated into some other sensitive issues. Um, but the, the delegation who went, Merkley thankfully is, is um, interested in this issue, but they were more interested, the others were on the trip because they were going to um, Indonesia afterwards and Papua New Guinea to, to look at the issue of um, climate change as well as the palm oil industry. So for them, Vietnam was just not, not the reason to go. And he could, they struggled to get the five, really struggled to get the five to go on that trip. Um, so it is frustrating for us. I mean, it, it kind of comes for me personally, I advocate for U.S. government to provide funding to address war legacy issues because I think they, they damn well should, first of all. Um, it's their moral obligation and it's humanitarian obligation that they need to do. But at the same time, when, when you see how the funding is used, like two-thirds of the money has gone to clean up Bien Hoa and Da Nang, yeah, important. but. I, when I talk to work with my Vietnamese I work with in rural Vietnam, they're, they're, they're trying to struggle day to day in caring for a child with a severe disability. I mean, they are not at all worried about what's happening in Da Nang or, or Binh Hoa. They're trying to just get through the day because they cannot work. Um, it, often it's a single mother, but even if there's a, it's a two-parent family, somebody has to be home full-time with that child, and that just makes life incredibly difficult. Um, and the average Vietnamese, I mean, most of the funding that goes to provide support to um, people who are believed to be impacted by Agent Orange is coming from the Vietnamese. It's coming from people who are raising money locally. It's not coming, I mean, my, my project is very small. The U.S. money that comes in now is 30 million this year, which is which is great, and it's but it's going towards um, things like teaching uh, oc occupational therapy, and um, and it's not just for people impacted by Agent Orange. It's the stroke victims, it's the active act accident victims, all good things. But it's we had to those of us who were advocating on this issue have had to force and push them into at least reaching some of those impacted by Agent Orange. 
um, and it's still a challenge, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's but, still not nationwide, right? It's still yeah. limited to certain yeah. provinces. Eight, eight provinces, eight provinces of, at, this, yeah, at the moment, they want to expand it to others. But I mean, the money that is coming in is coming from local Vietnamese businesses. That's the vast majority of the funding that's going to help, help people. It's Can I just interject sure. one thing? Because I was talking to an old a friend who's a State Department lawyer for many years, worked with John Kerry for years. And we were talking about how the lawyers still have their hands all over anything that might imply liability of any yes. kind. And still to this day, even though everyone kind of knows, nudge, nudge, that this money is for Agent Orange, there still has to be this language in the appropriations, regardless of cause. Yep. And it's because right. of the lawyers. And it's part of the reason I'm having, a, have had a difficult time in Laos in getting funding from the U.S. Yeah. government because that's that's a whole different war. <laughs> that was a whole. I mean, it, it was secret as we talked about earlier. Um, there could be some legal liability there in theory, but though, I mean, you can't really sue the U.S. government. So I mean, who are you going to sue? And you, the Vietnamese tried, failed. Um, well, they tried to sell the tried to sue the chemical companies and failed because they're under the same. Um, immunity as the U.S. Right. government, so it's they they have that hesitancy. I mean, they always talk about that, but they, it's almost impossible for anyone to sue them. So, mm -hmm. just do the right thing. <laughs> That's all I ask. I'm going to prompt you. You have to tell them the plastic chair story. <laughs> no, really, because this is about how little it takes. It's yeah, good, please. <laughs> it's <laughs> well. I mean, my organization, as I said, is very small, and most of my funding actually for the work I do in in Vietnam comes from the family of a Vietnam veteran who passed away in 2006. And at that time, the US had not yet started funding any um, programs in Vietnam related to Agent Orange. And before, he, he was getting um, VA disability benefits for his cancer that eventually killed him. But he wanted, and his wife wanted, this funding that he was getting from the US government to get to Vietnam to help people in Vietnam who were suffering from the impacts of Agent Orange like he was. Um, and so they called me up out of the blue, and I thought it was going to be a small little project, but and it, it's still small in, in the grand scale of things, but since 2007, about a half a million dollars has been given to me by his family, as well as friends and others um, who knew him, or people who were inspired by his story. And the money just goes directly to Vietnamese families who are believed to be impacted by Agent Orange, and we work with the Quang Nam Red Cross. And I was just there uh, a couple weeks ago meeting families for this next year of, of support. And we go in and we, we talk with the family. Is Usually it's someone caring for a very seriously disabled child who's um, very poor, on, you know, in, um, underneath the poverty level in Vietnam. And I got to this one family, and he had three children with disabilities. Um, his wife had died. And so we get to that point after talking with the family. And so, what is it that you know would would help your would help you um, with your with your life and with your family and your children? He said, "Well, I could use a red stool, a little red stool." And I don't if any of you have been to Vietnam, you you go to a beer hoy, and you know what I'm talking. About. It's a little plastic red stool, probably cost I don't know less than a dollar maybe. And I thought, what? a little red stool. I mean. Here's this foreign woman coming in, you know, offering assistance, and he's asking for something that's cost a dollar. <laughs> and I, and I asked him, I said, why do you need a little red stool? And he said, well, because I'm getting, I, he's a bike repairman. He said, I'm getting really old, I can't squat anymore. So if I had a real, if I had just could buy a little red stool, I could squat and continue repairing bikes. And I said, you know, I didn't want to say, but it only cost 10,000 dong or whatever at the time. But I said, okay, so how come you haven't bought one yet? Well, I mean, that basically that money would take away from caring for his children. So he was he was wanted to get his older daughter into school. And so we did, we bought the little red stool and then also a compressor so that he could fix motorbikes and not just blow up tires with the, you know, hand pump that he was doing and more materials, uh, more um, repair stuff. And he was, that was, I mean, it didn't make a huge change. His daughters were still disabled, but he could contribute to his family yeah. in a way that he couldn't before that. And, and that's, what, that's what we do. And it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't solve all of their problems, obviously. It doesn't solve any of their problems. But they all tell me that they're really um, 
touched by the fact that an American veteran, this money was coming from the family of American veteran who also suffered from Agent Orange and that they had an understanding of, this joint understanding about what um, the stuff that was dropped out of the air without them having any control over and has generational impacts, that there's this common link and they, they're always very um, honored to receive, you know, receive that help. Sure. And we have time for, for one more question. Kate. Hi, um, thanks for coming, really learned a lot. My question is kind of the fact that with the US coming in um, to coordinate and provide funding support on all these remediation projects, but not formally acknowledging responsibility, do you see this risk of painting a narrative of what some might call like white saviorism? The idea that America is coming in to help and make things right again, and if so, is that necessarily a bad thing if it gets both countries cooperating a bit more? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I often, when I talk about this book, I always remember it's it's interesting. The person who, the the American scientist who did most in the very very early days to halt the Agent Orange program. During the war, the Harvard microbiologist called uh, Matt Messelson, still alive at the age of 93, he's an amazing man. And he was giving the annual address to the American Academy for the Advancement of Science in 1970. And the future president came running up to him at the podium, slipped him a note, gave him a hug. And it was the announcement that Nixon was ending the Agent Orange program. That was Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist. And she is most famously remembered for a quote. This is a long way of answering your question. Never doubt that a small group of determined, I'm gonna get the quote wrong, but that a small group of determined, dedicated individuals can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I think the important thing to say, and it will embarrass Susan and Lady, no doubt, but this small group of people that I write about are exactly such a group because this is not and this is getting to your question, this is not about white saviorism. As I said, everyone in my book came to Vietnam and said, what do you need? What can we do to help? Here are some resources we have. Are they useful to you? But beyond the individual actions like Susan's program and what Lady did during the war and afterwards through her ongoing work, what the veterans have done, is they also pushed the US government to do things it didn't want to do. And I would say what is distinctive about US government aid for humanitarian projects in Vietnam is that it is not the white savior program. It is programs they were pushed, kicking and screaming to adopt because of this, frankly, group of individuals who cared enough and were dedicated enough and who were smart and dogged and imaginative and they played political angles and they just kept going. And they actually really do deserve the lion's share of the credit for what's been done. I mean, you could say, yeah, the American corporations who came in and made a lot of money out of rehabilitating the, the air bases at Da Nang and Benoit, you know, three American corporations walked away with $100 million from working on the Da Nang project, and the Benoit project is even bigger. You know, so there's some stuff there where you kind of hold your nose and you say, well, yeah, okay, corporate profits were made. But I think by and large, the, the work that's been done by the government is not white saviorism. There are no doubt cases of individuals who go in for their own reasons. They want to make a buck, they want to be heroes. But I think in a way, maybe I'm naive. I mean, I do believe that actually the aid to Vietnam, with all its limitations, has actually sort of escaped from that syndrome in, in a very, at least from the people I know who are involved, in, in, in quite almost an inspiring way. Yeah, the funding um, that's now going um, for the disability work um, is going to, I think it's eight organizations. Six of them are v local Vietnamese groups. And that w was effort by the Vietnamese, as well as some of us who've been w working on this and have Tim Reeser's ear, <laughs> um, was to like, it's got to go, it's got to go to the local organizations to fig you know, figure out what they know is 
can be done and, and best to help the people and not just all to, you know, the internet. At first, they did go to, mm, <laughs> I have nightmares about this, um, an organization called DAI, which I don't know what even stands for anymore, but they're a, they're a for-profit contractor that gets USAID funding. That's where the f first major money went. And all of us who work on this issue just, mm. <laughs> we were very unhappy about that because it, most of it didn't, did not leave the beltway, mm. the way that USAID grants works. But now it is finally doing that, but that's only because our people we work with in Vietnam and some of the organizations, you know, Chuck and Lady and others who, who um, said that it's got to go down to the local level um, for it to really make an impact. Um, but unfortunately, I heard on this last trip that one of the Vietnamese organization that has quite a lot of large USAID grant will not continue because of the bureaucracy that USAID puts on this funding. Mm -hmm. So. Well. We have reached the end of our allotted time, so let me uh, just say on behalf of everyone, thank you so much to both of you for what you've shared uh, here today. Thank you. Thank you. And, and congratulations thank you. again, George, on yeah. a, a wonderful book. Thank you.